kind of continue that thought. Philippians chapter 3. And then I'll jump into that one. Philippians chapter 3, again, Paul's writing to the Philippians. And in chapter 3, when you read it, he's talking about all the things that he can boast about. You now he's got more confidence to put, the, uh, put confidence in the flesh, circumcised of the eighth day, he's Israelite, of the tribe of Benjamin, he's a Pharisee, he has zeal, he had righteousness. Paul says this, what sort of things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Now, think about this. Paul had everything going for him that he could boast about being as righteous as a man could possibly be because he literally was about as good as anybody could get. As far as uh, worldly holiness, when you think about that, from a religious aspect, he was a holy man. But he was lost. And he had rejected the Messiah. And he was killing people. And so the, you really got to think of it from a lot of different viewpoints on that. But... But he was following with great zeal the law and found blameless in a lot of ways until he stood before the Lord. <laughs> and then he was humbled. I count those things lost. All the things that I can say, hey, you know, I got the Sunday school pin for 50 years worth of <laughs> you know, faithful attendance. I know people with this, man. I'm telling you, it's kind of funny. I used to give out pins for fa faithful attendance to Sunday school. What is the Lord going to do with that when we get to heaven? <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Don't do good. <laughs> you know, he's going to be like, that's not the most important thing. We, we judge differently than God does. And so Paul's like, look, I'm just going to I'm not going to worry about that. Moreover, I count all things to be lost. Everything to be lost. In view of the surpassing value of what, what do you think was the most important thing? Knowing Jesus Christ as his Lord. All of the other stuff didn't matter. Because if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord, then you are justified fully through the blood of Christ and you are made new, a new creation. You're adopted into the family of God. You're covered by the blood of Christ. You have the spirit that's been given to you as an as a, uh, you know, uh, earnest of your inheritance. You are made a son. You know, you're one of God's children. Nothing in this world matters as much as knowing Christ as Lord. Just puts it all in perspective. It doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have. It doesn't matter how big your house is or isn't. It doesn't matter if you've got anything going for you or not. Do you know Christ as Lord? It's perspective. Well, when you know Christ as Lord, then you stand before the judge and see Christ. If you don't know the Christ as Lord, you don't come to life until the end, and at that point, this will go. I count all things as be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and Paul did suffer all the loss. And he said, Counts them the blood rubbish that I may gain Christ, more that I may gain Christ. Paul was Paul was saved, man. He was a saved man. What is he trying to gain beyond justification? Paul wanted to receive rewards from the Lord. He understood there was a great reward waiting for those who are faithful. I think that the, the, the doctrine of rewards is not one that we talk a lot about because I don't think we truly understand it all. That it can be kind of confusing and misconstrued. But if we understand the great blessing of being able to gain those rewards and you can gain them by your life, then I think it might propel some of us on to love, greater love and greater works. Might. Justification is secure. You're positionally sanctified, but as you, as you live your life in faithfulness and you become practically sanctified through your living, then there's this aspect of the glorification when you stand before Christ that your rewards, you may gain some reward that somebody else might not. Where do I find that in the scripture? Note what it said in Revelation 20. Why do the people who have their heads cut off and die in the millennial kingdom, why did they get especially come back to life? And they reign with Christ. They died a very unique death. They chose not to take the mark of the beast. 
Does that mean that everybody else gains the same reward as they do? No. This is just a mentioning of them. And there are some that they only, only them, get to sing a special song that nobody else can learn. We find that in the book of Revelation. There are rewards unique for them because of their faithfulness. And not everybody gets to live in that time. Not everybody gets to endure that. But there's a unique reward for them. And not everybody's called to that. So there are unique rewards for certain groups of individuals. Does that negate the universality of justification for all who come to know Christ? No. Because all who have been born again are born again. But even Jesus in his parables talks about this. That there are some rewards that are unique for some individuals. And there are things that he's going to do for everybody that are the same, and there are some that are not. Well, Paul's saying, I count everything as lost, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having the righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. He wanted to make sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that he was justified by faith. His hope was in Christ, not in his works. But also, that he would know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now that's a weird verse. If we understand what the scripture says, who will attain to a resurrection from the dead? Who's going to be resurrected? Everybody will. In the end, everybody will. So what's Paul referring to? I think Paul is referring to this resurrection. He wanted to make sure he was in the millennial kingdom. He wanted to lay his life down through faithfulness to make sure that when he, he could be standing before Christ and receive rewards and enter into the kingdom. He's looking at his whole life, everything that happened before this. And he's like, what difference does it make if I'm stoned to death or I lose all these things? All of that was lost anyways. I want to gain Christ. I want to be with Christ. I want to be here. I want to be where the Lord's at in this section. I want to be part of that day of rest. All of those things that I could have boasted about are nothing. I want to know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, be conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. And if you read that in Greek, it literally says the out-resurrection. There's another resurrection he's talking about, not the general resurrection of the dead. He wanted to attain to that special resurrection. Because we know what the scripture says. The dead in Christ will rise. He didn't want to be ashamed before the appearance of Christ. He wanted to be rewarded when Christ comes back. The best I can describe this is if you had a boss who, you had a job, and things were going good because the boss is normally there and you can kind of keep track of everybody. But if the boss had to leave for a day and come back the next day, he would know exactly what was going on. Would, he be, would you be able to say that you did your job? He would know. Because he's paying attention to what's going on. Even if he doesn't have security cameras, right? You can still tell what's going to happen. What happened. You can look at what's going on and you can look at the numbers and you can look at what happened and you can say, okay, well, who did what? But if you were found not doing what you're supposed to when the boss came back, what would happen? Or wouldn't have a job. I mean, there's some people who are promoted based on their faithfulness. So we even understand that in our, in our normal and natural life. The judgment seat of Christ is a judgment for rewarding, not for condemnation. What does Romans say? Romans chapter 8. This is Matt's favorite chapter. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There's no condemnation of that judgment. That judgment is a judgment of reward. It's when we stand before the purifying fire of the eyes of Christ, we're all going to suffer some loss, but we're going, to, we're going to look back and say, there's the foundation. The foundation is more precious than anything that's built upon it. The foundation is Christ. He wanted to be found in Him. There's the foundation. We saw the foundation. What else was left? It's unique when you have a house fire and you look at what's left and you think, Everything, everything with no value is gone now. We, you got a foundation. There's something to start right there. Right there. Because there's a lot of places that don't even have a foundation. You ain't got no foundation. 
Life, life comes and everything is burnt up and you got nothing to show for it. He could boast about all of those other things. And he says this, you know, I'm going to put it all to the side. I'm going to, not that I've already obtained it or become perfect. But I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as laying hold of it yet, but this, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on to the goal, I press on, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, as many as of our, as of our perfect or mature, let us have this attitude, and if any, and if anything, you have a different attitude, God will only allow that also to you. So there, there comes a point in our Christian maturity where we understand we're not living for this life anyways. We're living for a better life in the other, on the other side. Abraham was a man living in tents in the land of promise, but he understood that he wasn't going to get it then, he'd get it later. So he lived his life a very different way. And if we understand that we're not going to have the best life here, we're going to have it later, we're going to live a different way. And, and all the things that we would, we would be uh, tempted to hold on to because they're so valuable in this life, we'll be willing to just give it, a, give it up because it doesn't matter anyways. What matters most is what we do for the Lord. And when we stand before Him, that'll be evident. We won't be able to lie about it. There won't be any ability to say, but I did this, and Jesus will say, I know what you did. I've been watching. We have the books right here. It's right here. You want me to read it to you? I don't think there'll be any argument. There won't be any argument. Keep pressing on to the prize. There's a prize. Not justification. Justification is secure. That's the reason why we get to stand before the Lord. What we're talking about is the effects of sanctification that lead to glorification. The aspects of salvation that we don't talk about very much. Well, one more passage, and I think I just want to stop with this one, and then we'll take it back up with some other ones next time. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and this one is, I've thought about this one for years. Um, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to give account. How's that going to work? Paul's having a discussion about what the Philippians or the, the Corinthians were, were discussing. Some were of Paul, some were of Paulus. Some were of Cephas, Peter. And Paul's like, look, I, I planted Apollos water. God caused the growth. It doesn't matter who the men were. Are you following the Lord? We're God's fellow workers. You're God's field. You're God's building. And he says this, according to the grace of God, which was given me as a wise master builder, I laid the foundation and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. Paul shared the gospel with them initially. Other people helped along the way. And it doesn't matter who the pastor was or the member was or the Christian was, the disciple who, who shared the gospel with you. If the foundation has been laid, it's been laid. Be careful how you build it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation. If you don't have Christ, you don't have a building. You'll have any, you won't have anything left when you stand before the Lord in that fiery judgment anyways. It'll all be gone. There's no foundation. What the Lord is trying to do is determine, do you have a foundation? Jesus is the foundation. If any man builds upon the foundation gold, silver, precious stones, those are the good things, right? When we're living for the Lord, when we're practicing the fruits of the Spirit, when we're being um, you know, obedient to the Lord and we're sharing the gospel and doing the things He tells us to, wood, hay, straw, and we all got that. Those are the things that are not so precious. The things that we thought were important but weren't. The things that we embellish life with, but they're not near as important as we think they are. If any man builds upon the foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it. What day? The day when we stand before Christ. The day of the judgment seat of Christ. On that day, when we stand before the Lord, it will be shown for what it is. Because it's to be revealed with fire. Peter says, since this world will end in such a way, by the judgment, how then should we live? How people should we be? 
if we know we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to go through the fire of His judgment, not for salvation, for justification, but for salvation in regards to sanctification and glorification, for rewards, we're secure that we're His children, how should we live? It's not a question of whether or not you have a relationship with God. It's what did you do for it? You're there, okay? You're going to get there. But, but what, what do you have to show for it? The judgment seat of Christ reveals that. The fire of Jesus' intense holiness will just reveal it for what it is. We'll stand before the Lord and it, there will be nothing hidden. As I said, you won't be worried about what other people think about your life. You'll be worried about what Jesus thinks about your life. It will be revealed. The fire will reveal it. The fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. I've had my work quality checked before. When I was a welder, when I was a ship fitter at Eagles, they checked it all the time. And the last thing I ever wanted to have to do was go back and refit something, especially after somebody welded it, put all more work into it. I learned real quickly to make sure it was done right the first time. I learned that from my dad. He had to go back and do chores over and over again. I hated to do something the second time. And even in my own business, I hate to do things twice. I hate to do them over again. Because it's such a, it's a frustrating process. But when you get before the Lord, there's no going back and redoing it. The only opportunity we have to do, to do it for the glory and honor of the Lord is now. If you mess up, you can, you can apologize and make it right. That's what we should be, right? But we're going to stand before, I don't think most people understand this. You will stand before the Lord. You will give an account. And there won't be any lying. There won't be any way for you to lie. Because the God, God, God knows. God knows. You can't pull the wool over the guy whose eyes are full of fire. He burned up. <laughs> right? It's gone. There's, he can see through everything. He knows your thoughts. He knows your heart. He knows your intentions. He knows everything that's going on. You might lie to me and everybody else, but you're never going to lie to God. <clears throat> and you're going to stand before the Lord and give an account. The fire itself will test the quality of every man's work. Every individual who knows the Lord will stand before him. And will. If any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. The scripture cannot be any clearer. If something remains, you get to receive a reward. What that reward is, I'm not exactly sure. There are rewards mentioned in the scripture. We'll tackle that probably in the Sunday evening. But you will receive a reward if something remains. So there's a possibility of gaining rewards based on the life that you live. That's not an unbiblical concept. That's not an issue of justification, have you been born again. It's an issue of how obedient you are in the act of sanctification in your life that leads to glorification. Have you done anything for Jesus? Well, if you have, and it remains, after the fire of God's judgment, you will receive a reward. But, if any man's work is burnt up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. Even if you've got nothing left, you have the foundation. Because the foundation can't be burned. And I think there's a blessing in that. Because the Lord will not, the Lord will not lose any of his own. And there's going to be a lot of people I'm afraid, and who knows, I might even be one. The only thing you got left is foundation. But we're all going to suffer through the same fire of God's judgment. It's a judgment of love as He's purifying us. And what's, what's that? Will we receive a reward? I want you to have precious jewels and gold and silver built up in the heavenly realm. I want that to be left over for you. And that's, that's a driving force for Paul. That's a driving force for me. I want you to hear well done. Not for me. <laughs> We're going to stand right beside each other, maybe, and stand before the Lord, and the Lord's going to, He's going to look at all of us, and it'll be fire. <laughs> What's left? That fire that's been burning out there this afternoon burned up a lot of things. 
But that's nothing compared to the fire of God's judgment. The fire of God's judgment is thorough and complete, and there's no hiding from it. If work remains, you will receive the reward. If nothing remains, except for the foundation, you'll be saved, because you're already justified, but you'll be saved through that sanctification, that glorification, you'll have nothing left except the foundation. There is no reward. You get to be in the kingdom, but you got no reward. You're there, okay? You get to enjoy the Lord, which is beyond imagination, and, and, and really, it's a great thing. I'm not downplaying that, but could you imagine not having any reward? You're there, but you got no reward. You got Christ, that's awesome. We want that. But you got nothing to show Be obedient. I just want to close with that. The fire you see, the judgment seat of Christ, we all will stand before it. We're all going to give an account, but not everybody's going to receive the reward. I think that there'll be some who will be in the tribulation who will shirk back and they'll be destroyed, but they might come to life again at the end, and there's not a reward for them. Uh, they were unfaithful, um, and you know they're there, but but they don't get to receive the same reward as these martyrs do. And there'll be people who maybe they didn't live through that time, but but their life has been such shambles because they've been so rebellious against God that they'll be there because they're justified by faith, but they'll have no reward because their life has been a mess and they never did really do what the Lord says. And there is that warning when we stand before the Lord, and the Lord will be like, "I never knew you. I just." Make sure, Paul's like, I want to make sure, I want to make sure beyond a shadow of God for my own sake. I just want to make sure for me that I'm following the Lord, I'm listening to his voice, I'm doing what he tells me, even to the very end, because I want to know. Maybe that's what should drive us. You should want to know that the Lord is in you and you are in him. And for that, you know, when we get to that point, and if there are rewards, we'll just be surprised that we got them because we, you know. It's, it's better than we thought it could be, you know. So, don't you know that the Spirit, that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Don't you know that? This body will decay. The Lord is in you if you know Him. So therefore, live in such a way to honor Him. Be found walking worthy of the calling that you receive. This is an echo of it to this morning service. He is worthy he is worthy of all power and glory and praise. And because of that, we should live in such a way that honors him. That's the reason. So we got through a couple of those verses. You guys got any questions about any of that? Any other questions that you think maybe in the future we want to answer? I'm going to hit a couple of these other ones next Sunday night. Try to get through that. And then I'm going to look at the... Um, the parables of Jesus, especially in Matthew 24 and 25, that deal specifically with this. Because Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. And he's giving you a preview of what will happen and how all this will play out. Any thoughts? Question? I hope that's an encouragement to you. There's a reward to be gained. You understand that? And that reward to be gained is, I just can't imagine that. Can you imagine Stephen being martyred and Jesus standing up welcoming him? Uh, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's a great thing to want to gain. So, so do everything you possibly can to gain that. You're secure in Christ because of justification by faith that gives you the ability to honor and please the Lord. So go and honor and please the Lord. And find the reward, seek for that reward that the Lord has out there. He's saying, I've got a prize for you. I just want you to do what I'm telling you, then to go do it. And, and find that, that glory of God. And, and uh, praise the Lord in the middle of that.